And our next speaker is Dr. Uma Malotra, who's an infectious disease specialist at Virginia Mason Hospital in Seattle. We're going to be talking about infectious disease issues and public health concerns as they pertain to meat production and consumption from the farm to the fork. So almost all meat and dairy production in the US as also in most parts of the world comes from what we call industrial food animal production systems. And these involve you know, thousands of cattle, tens of thousands of pigs, hundreds of thousands of chickens, all confined in single facilities, causing you know, tremendous overcrowding and enormous amounts of animal waste. Okay, so these production systems really cause serious public health concerns for the animals, the industry workers, rural communities, and consumers of animal products, as well as the general public. And this is what the face of intensive farming looks like today. So the industrial uh, production systems, as well as the intensive farming, produce animal overcrowding, which induces stress and susceptibility to infections. There is transmission of diseases from the animals to workers who might then spread the infections to their communities. And there's also infections from consuming raw and undercooked meat, which I won't be touching upon today. And what we will see is that the animal feed today includes enormous amounts of antibiotics which can contaminate the food supply. And there is emergence of antibiotic resistance which really erodes the effectiveness of life-saving drugs. And finally, there is emergence of novel viruses including new influenza strains. So I'll be touching upon mostly the last two aspects today. So antibiotic use in livestock initially started by treat uh, for treatment purposes and this further expanded to prevention of infection as uh, overcrowding in animal um, food production industries uh, took place. But over the last several decades, subtherapeutic doses of antibiotics have been incorporated in the animal feed. And this is to promote growth in intensive animal farming, as well as to improve what we call food conversion efficiency, and which likely happens by affecting gut flora. So what is the history of antimicrobial use in the US? So in the early 1900s, uh, there was a meat shortage, in part due to increased demands for meat. And this resulted in protests and pressure to rear large numbers of animals over a short period of time to meet new consumer demands. And along with the new large animal densities came the threat of disease and need for disease control. And in the 50s, a group of US scientists found that adding antibiotics to the animal feed could uh, you know, reduce the risk for infection, and, but also increased growth. And so by 2001, an astounding 80% of the total antimicrobial use in the US was actually for non-therapeutic purposes in animal agriculture. So here is a graph from the Pew Research, which shows that about 30 million pounds of antibiotics each year are given to livestock, and this is as opposed to about seven million pounds to treat sick people. So how does resistance develop? So animals are typically either given the antibiotics in their feed or uh, applied on their skin, so they are skin or fur, so they can, um, part of the grooming process, consume the antibiotics. And then the antibiotics kill a um, you know, majority of the bacteria, but select for antibiotic resistant bacteria. And uh, these antibiotic resistant bacteria or superbugs and are then uh, can be carried by the farm workers into the community or the drug resistant bacteria can linger on improperly cooked meat or there can be uh, you know, leaching of these, uh, the fertilizer or the water containing animal feces causing spread of the superbugs to the food crops. So um, there have been many um, outbreaks of drug resistant bacteria that have been linked to various farms. So there have been linkage of, uh, you might well have heard about MRSA infections. So there has been linkage described to various you know, animal farms. Uh, and the MRSA strains and spreading into the community. So this is a graph that shows the rise in uh, prevalence of Salmonella superbugs. So Salmonella is a type of bacteria that is found in poultry and 
What is difficult to see is the years, but over the last uh, decade, you know, about 10 to 20 percent of the salmonella packages that were um, analyzed by the FDA, they were found to contain salmonella that were resistant to one or more antibiotics. And the graph on the right shows the trends. So, um, you know, showing one versus uh, three versus four antibiotic so bacterial strains that were resistant to either one antibiotic, two antibiotic, or three antibiotics. So really, you know, resulting in emergence of uh, superbugs. So the consumption by animals, it's not just esoteric antibiotics. So it's um, the antibiotics that are consumed or fed to the animals are really, you know, medically important antibiotics. So as you see there, about twice as many medically important antibiotics are fed to animals for, uh, you know, just growth purposes uh, versus what is uh, given to humans. And so here is, you know, what we see uh, for a number of countries the antibiotic use in livestock, and uh, this is antibiotic use, you know, based on, um, you know, milligrams per kilo body mass of uh, the meat. And U.S. is somewhere over here. So up here are the Scandinavian countries with, and New Zealand and Australia, which have the lowest amount of antibiotics, and U.S. is really among the, you know, among the highest. So, and the regulation actually is quite weak. And just over the last two years, there have been increasing efforts to try to regulate the antibiotics uh, that are you know, fed to the animals for preventive purposes, so which is a step in the right direction. So I'm going to switch gears a bit here. Um, I want to talk about emergence of novel viruses. And over the last century, there has been emergence of a number of novel viruses, and several of these are influenza strains. And what we find is that among these novel viruses, majority of them actually are zoonoses, so, so viruses that have been uh, acquired uh, from animals. So on the bottom, you know, what are, are several influenza strains, and on the top are other viruses, mostly from the flavivirus category. So here is an example of uh, how we have emergence of novel influenza viruses. So frequent contact that can occur among large population of hogs, birds, and humans, such as what would happen in uh, an industrial food production system or in a uh, live animal market. And that's what you know, creates the ideal condition for the generation of new influenza viruses. And here is an example of what happened in 2013 that led to the emergence of a novel avian influenza virus. And this really was a re assorted virus that contained gene segments from two, um, two domestic poultry and two wild uh, birds. And, you know, leading to a new influenza strain. So what happens with a lot of these uh, viruses is that these viruses actually do not cause the animals to become ill and really can cause much, you know, cause a very severe illness in the humans. So in some ways it can be very very difficult to detect the emergence of these uh, new virus strains because the animals may remain actually relatively healthy. And, um, you know, another interesting, I don't know how many of you knew, but bats are really the most populous mammal. And, um, and there are a number of bat species, and these bat species really can carry, you know, large numbers of viruses that can be actually very pathogenic to humans. And the Ebola epidemic in part really arose through, um, in parts of the world with consumption of uh, soup that contained fruit bats. And also, there have been emergence of a number of other viruses that have been transmitted from the bats to the humans. And it may not be sometimes directly through interaction with the bats, but there can be what we call spillover dynamics, where, for example, some of the farm animals may be exposed to the bats, and then the viruses from the bats could be transmitted to the farm animals, and then on to humans. And that has led to you know, several epidemics. Uh, SARS was a very severe respiratory illness that um, came about several years ago, and um, you know, more recently, the swine flu. So to summarize, the modern meat production systems 
that include you know, industrial food production with intensive farming practices and live animal markets, increase animal susceptibility to infections, and this leads to transmission of diseases from animals to workers who can then spread the infections to their communities. The feed antibiotics that we saw, those can contaminate food supply, and the feed antibiotics lead to emergence of antibiotic resistance, and that erodes effectiveness of you know, what are life-saving drugs, and finally, what we have seen is emergence of novel virus strains and zoonoses. So I think um, that, and as we heard from several of the other speakers before, you know, what, so what is the solution? And I think the solution is, you know, for many it may be movement to vegetarianism, but for many others it may be really, uh, you know, reducing the amounts of meat consumption. Thank you very much.